I got radically saved when I was 16. I was on an Indian reservation as American field service student. And I was invited to a revival, didn't know what it was, a revival, and absolutely undone. I was white and everybody else was American Indian and I was completely transformed that day. Just saved, born again, undone. And the Pentecostal holiness people got a hold of me and they said, you need the Holy Ghost. So I went to their church and the Holy Spirit fell on me. It was March 14th, 1976. March 13th, 1976, I was saved. I was saved. I was totally saved. The next night, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And I mean, the power of God hit me. Like what we're seeing here happened in that little Pentecostal Holiness Church in Mississippi. I, I fell down on the floor. I went rolling up and down the aisle. I mean, I was a holy roller. <laughs> I was a holy roller. I, I spoke in tongues. I was unable to speak in English. They rolled out a bathtub. They said, you need to be baptized. And they stuck me in the bathtub and I was changed. So here I am just praying and worshiping. And I've got my hands lifted up in church and the presence of God hits me. Like this light just comes on me and I'm frozen there. And it turns out I was frozen for three hours. And I hear God say, you're called to be a missionary and a minister to go to Africa, Asia, and England. No one asks a 16-year-old to get up back then and preach in their church. They do now. But back then, they didn't. So I heard God. I stepped out on a street corner and started preaching the gospel the next day. And I've never stopped. I was doing big, big meetings in my 20s and the big outdoor meetings with thousands of people raising their hands and running forward. And one day, God stopped me. And he said, you don't know anything about the kingdom. You need to sit with the poor. And I, I said, but God, I'm a missionary. And, and I rebuked the enemy first because I didn't think God would tell me to stop doing massive meetings. And he stopped me and he sat me with the poor. And he did that for about 18 years. Sat me with the poorest of the poor in the slums. And he said, now you're learning about the kingdom. And then he sent me to Mozambique by myself, uh, one-way ticket, got the airfare the day before I left. He said, I want you to go with nothing, sit on the street corner. So I just obeyed him and I went. And, and Rollin was still writing up his thesis. And I went to Mozambique, sat on a street corner to learn just Portuguese, Shangan, sitting there. And I'm seeing all these dying children in rags. They're dirty. They're dying. They're sick. They're, they're sleeping under bridges. I had nowhere to sleep. I, I didn't know where to go. I had no money. I had nothing. I'm just on the street corner. I heard God go to Mozambique. There I am, all just God and me and these street kids. And he said, take them home. Oh, great. I don't have a home. <laughs> yes, Lord. <laughs> he said, you learned about my kingdom from the poor. Now I want you to learn about my kingdom from the children. And there's something about what God does in Toronto that's very childlike and it's also for the poor in spirit people come here poor uh, i came here poor in spirit I, I i started picking up these dying kids broken kids sick kids and i had 320 of them and after being a missionary for all those years i was like i'm tired I love you, Jesus. I love you with all my heart, but let me work in Kmart, anywhere where there's no stress. And what happens in Toronto is the poor in spirit come. The poor in spirit come to eat and drink. They say we have to have more. And so they fly across the world for a drink because they're that poor. That's who I am. I'm poor in spirit. I'm, I'm a little woman who's just desperate. So after Asia went to UK and uh, heard about Toronto and I didn't have the finances to get here. I, I wanted to and I was driving around a roundabout and I started screaming out to God, Lord, whatever you're doing in Toronto, you have to do it here. I can't get there now. I'm desperate, desperate. And God just boom, falls in my car and just 
pouring out his presence in my car and the car gets stalled on the roundabout and the Holy Spirit's hitting me. And I go to my church Sunday morning and I'm like, everything that's happening in Toronto, do it here, Lord. And our church had never seen this kind of power or presence. The Holy Spirit just fell in our church in London, just boom. And people started laughing, rolling, shaking. This guy who could barely walk starts leaping off the floor like couple of feet off the floor and God's moving. Roland somehow got a ticket to Toronto and he just sobbed for a month. He was, he was supposed to come for a week, stayed for a month, sobbing, crying. His whole life transformed. So I finally get to Mozambique. I'm on my own, on a street corner, starting taking and dying children. And then I got really sick. Roland and my kids joined me. And, and after months of this, I just got sick, double pneumonia, sick, tired. I mean, we were getting shot at. We were, you know, we'd been beat up, shot at the Marxist. It was, it was just rough. Okay. It was rough. And I'm crying, God, oh God, I want to get to Toronto, but I can't get there. And somehow I got a, a ticket on Egypt air and I made it to the rest and renewal home for missionaries. I walk in the building and these people were speaking. I thought, I've heard these people before and I came a long way and I'm so tired and I have double pneumonia. And they said, there's a missionary that came in the room who has double pneumonia and God's healing her right now. Take a deep breath. This is my first time in Toronto. And I just, I start to breathe and my lungs just completely cleared. Boom, I fall on the floor. And instead of God saying, oh, sweetheart, just go to Kmart, he showed me himself. I saw him in this way, face to face. I saw his eyes like burning like fire. And they're just burning. And this love hit me like, whoa, I'll do anything. And and I already thought I was doing anything for him, but just this passion in my heart. And then I looked around and there were thousands and thousands of children. And I started screaming out loud in church. See, people don't always know what's happening when someone's screaming in church. And here I am, no one knows what I do or where I'm from or why I'm screaming. And and no one stopped me. Like they let God move in this house. That's refreshing. (laughs) They let God move in this house. And I'm screaming, no, which is not what you should scream, but God knows my heart. I was thinking it's too hard. And I saw all these kids. And then he said, look into my eyes. And I looked into his eyes. And he said, I died that there would always be enough. He just ripped a piece of his flesh out of his side. And his flesh was broken. Like his body was bruised and broken. He just ripped it out. And he handed it to me. He said, eat this. Give it to the children. And I took this piece of flesh and I thought, that's ugly. That's just ugly. And how am I going to feed it to the children? And I just, in obedience, I just reached out my hand and his flesh turned into bread. And in this vision, I started feeding the children. And I fed thousands and thousands of these children. And he said to me again, I died that there would always be enough. Then he handed me a cup and put it right next to his side. And it was a poor man's cup. It wasn't gold. It didn't have jewels. It was just, and out of his side, holy side, flowed blood and water. And he said, this is a cup of suffering and joy. Will you drink it? I said, yes, I'll drink it, Lord. I'll drink it. And I just put it to my lips and I drank the cup of suffering and joy. Not understanding, but just being obedient to to his loving heart, his face, his eyes. I couldn't say no to him. My no turned into a yes on the floor in Toronto. My no, my fear of what it would be like to feed thousands and thousands of children and to just believe that there was always enough. My fear, the fear of that just dissipated in his love. And I holy, I reached out the cup and I started giving it to the children and they all drank. And since that day, I've never said no to a dying child. 
and and now you know we went from a tiny little ministry of you know what was it three four churches and 320 children to just it just exploded it exploded. We have thousands of children and hundreds and hundreds on our staff. And God just keeps pouring out. But he keeps saying to me, keep drinking. And I just keep coming back every year just for more. And I get touched here. I get healed here. I get transformed here. So it's such an understatement to say my life's been transformed. It's not only been transformed, it's been turned upside down and inside out. I'll never be the same. And I'm still desperate. I'm still thirsty. Randy Clark was, was talking and suddenly said, I have to change my message. I need to speak about the apostolic anointing. Well, that word kind of bothered me because I'd seen a lot of arrogance surrounding the word. So my little theological brain was ticking and, ah, but I, I was, I couldn't help it. I, he said apostolic blessing. And I was praying for a Brazilian who had a mouth filled with gold. I mean, that was already wild and she's screaming. And, and suddenly Randy says apostolic anointing and God just flips me up on side of my head, on top of my head. And I can't do this physically. And I'm thinking, oh, sweet Jesus, thank you that I'm wearing trousers. That's all I could, because I was Pentecostal holiness. You know, I only wore skirts and I was really grateful for trousers. And I'm on my head and Randy's saying more and he's enjoying it. And I'm like, what are you doing, God? And as I'm up on my head, the Lord said, holy apostolics upside down. It's the lowest place. And then Ian Ross comes and he said, is it okay as if you have to ask me at that point? I'm on my head screaming in church. It's just, it's bizarre. If I was an onlooker, I'd say, it's weird. That woman's whacked. And he said, can I pour water on your head, uh, water down your feet? And I'm like, of course, you know. But he doesn't take a nice little bottle. He gets a big old big bottle and he just pours it down my feet as my legs are in the air and I'm on my head and he's just saying more Lord more Lord and God just hits me and I didn't understand what the water was about and then the Lord showed me later that it was that Ezekiel 47 we'd be totally immersed in the river and it was also the floods coming to my nation that would transform the nation, would make them desperate and thirsty and hungry because all these people were dying and stranded. And a couple months after this water is poured down my leg and I'm turned upside down and taken to the lowest place and bruised head to toe, the floods hit my nation, just devastating my nation. And thousands of people are hungry and homeless. And God said to me again, I died that there would always be enough. You give them something to eat. And we were just a tiny little ministry. We, how are we going to feed all these people? He said, you give them something to eat. And because of what God did on the floor in Toronto, I dared to believe that little me, little us, little Arco ears, little Iris, we could just reach out and, and God would multiply it. And he did. We started buying bags of bread and literally would multiply the bread and people would eat. And then the UN would say, Mama Ida, how many helicopters do you need? And they would just like, give me helicopters to fly people around. At times I would get seven helicopters in a day to fly around preachers and doctors and nurses and ministers of the gospel and just going out to the unreached people and feeding them living bread, bread from heaven and bread from the earth. And then it just exploded. We went from, from 100 churches to thousands of churches. So if you see a little odd thing happening on the floor, it's good to find out the story. It's good to hear the story because God's doing something in that person. You might not understand it, but it's powerful because he's doing it. And it's a beautiful thing.
during Bill's message, I was sobbing my heart out. Sobbing. Why? Not because I was sad, not because I, I needed more healing in an area. I was crying because I was so desperate for more of God, just to obey Him, just to, to obey Him whatever it cost, to love Him more, to give Him every cell of my being. And there was this just desperation hitting me to say, God, just take me, break me, use me. I just want you. I want your presence. And I just sobbed until just a few minutes ago, you know, my eyes were just swollen from sobbing. My trousers were sopped from sobbing because I just want him. And in this house, he, he, year after year, he just causes more of his self, more of himself to be revealed to my heart. And I, I just say, yes, there's no, no left in me to him. There's only a yes cry to him. See, what happened in this house was people re were released to be free, to let God touch them in any way he was touching them. And year after year, they had to make a choice. Day after day, John and Carol had to make a choice to say, here are the reins, God. We're not going to pull back. We're not going to take it back. We're not going to hold on. We're going to let you have it. We're going to let you do what you want to do in these people. And even if we don't understand, here it is. And they released people to be touched radically. And they said yes every day. Yes every day to God's presence. And we are so grateful to John and Carol. I mean, well, what can we even say? We don't have words to thank them enough for the freedom in this house. And everyone involved in this ministry, they just let us love God and fall in love with Him in a greater way.